I'd like to share a message with you today entitled, Back on the Line. Would you say that with me? Back on the Line. I do not have dreams often or hear uh, prophetic things in my mind often, but I do on occasion, and I've learned to heed them, even though they may be a mixture of me. Hello, John might be a mixture of me and a mixture of God. I understand that. But a few weeks ago, I was laying on the couch trying to get a nap, and uh, uh, my, I have this last two rounds of chemo really knocked me for a loop. Uh, I was so fatigued, and I shared this with our intercessory group. I was so, so fatigued. I could not walk from where I'm at here to that wall. I don't mean run. I mean, I could not walk it. I'd have to sit down because my legs were just wobbly. And I never had fatigue like that in my life. And I'm I'm predisposed a little bit towards depression anyway. And then the medication that I'm on, one of the side effects is depression. Don't you love that? You know, you're on some high-potent medication. There's a lot of side effects. Like mine says diarrhea, next one, constipation. They get you coming and going, I tell you. It's like everything that can go wrong, they put in there. Suicidal thoughts. Good night. That's all a person predisposed to depression needs to read. So anyway, I hear this phrase, just as I'm waking up from a nap, uh, get on the line. And just a moment after that, I had a picture of my mind of a woman who had been abused and beat up and was kind of like lying on the side of the road. I recognized her. Happened to be a woman that I had judged for not having a good marriage and a woman that had considered divorce and there's something self-righteous in me that rose up and wanted to judge her. Like, if you would just love him, and don't you know you're a Christian? And I had all the little rags. I've, I've always had, since I have a good marriage, I have a tendency in my flesh to quickly judge people that are going through a divorce, even though I know I shouldn't. It's kind of, it's kind of like, it, it's a self-righteousness on my part. And when I saw this woman, in my, and it was very vivid, I felt a great compassion for her. It looked like she had been assaulted. And that self-righteousness that wants to judge just evaporated. So I had these two experiences back to back. Now, you never want to judge something based on experience. Can you hear an amen to that? Amen. You want to judge it by the word of God in concert with the character and nature of God. Then I realized I had been watching Band of Brothers. For like, like I, I, I watched it for the third time. Anybody here seen Band of Brothers? Guys, it's the best. Isn't it the best? Oh, it's just, if you've not seen it, it's 10 hours. It's a whole series on HBO. It's fantastic. I don't think there's one woman in the whole, in the whole 10 hours. Why I threw that in there, I have no idea. But it's about soldiers, an easy company. It's a true story. It's off, based off a book that was well-researched, and it's true. In the interview, the original easy company soldiers in, the, in this 10-hour movie, documentary movie, Spielberg and, and Tom Hanks, they, they uh, produced and directed it. And in the movies where I heard the phrase, get on the line, and an easy company, like, like in any war, there's a line between you and the enemy. And, and, and they're the most forwarded uh, soldiers in the army. And there's the Germans right there. You could actually see them. They could see each other. And you could not get any closer than the line. And they dig, they, they dig foxholes 
and they wait and they fire and then they attack and retreat and, and that's where all the act, that's where all the casualties are that's where all the victories happen that's where all the danger is that's where you have to be at your top alert proactive awareness not only for yourself but for your for the band of brothers and then after you're on the line for a week you rotate off go behind the lines a couple of miles and you rest. You shower, you get a good meal, you rest, and then you go back on the line. And several times in the movie, the commanding officer would say to Easy Company, we're going off the line. And there'd be a real sense of relief because the guys could come off the combat positions and come back, and then when they're starting to rest, then the commanding officer would say, it's time to go back on the line. So there was this rotation of people in combat, people in R&R, &R, people in the forward position of warfare and those that are convalescing because they've been beat up a little bit. So when the Lord said to me, Dan, it's time to get on the line, get back on the line, I knew what he meant. It's time to get back on the line in prayer. Others have been carrying your weight a long time. And rightly so, if you're fatigued enough and depressed enough, you, you, you just barely get through a day. And you're not really that threatening in intercession. And I have been carried in prayer for a long time. I have fought cancer for 19 years, and I've had lots of miracles on the journey. Without a praying church, I would have passed years ago. That's not my words. That's the words of a doctor. So I've had miracle after miracle, and now I need another miracle. And, and you know, I, you, get, you, get, you get weary of this thing after a while. Like, gee, how many times have I got to go to the doctor? You know, how many times have I got to be scared? You know how much blood I've given? I have probably given a quart of blood for every one of you. Just like, why don't you just leave the needle in there? Because I just, and the Lord said to me, I believe it was him. He said, Dan, it's time to get back on the line. It's time to re-engage. It's time to get back in a forward position of intercession and prayer. You've had, you've had enough time of rest. And rest is important. You can't, be, you can't have the pedal to the metal all the time in every spiritual dynamic. You can't do that. You have to rest. You have to separate. And I have rested. There's 16 prayer meetings in this church praying for me every week for my health. It's the most humbling thing that I've ever experienced. I'm still humbled and almost want to weep just telling you about it, that I could be loved like that. Sixteen groups of people. And yet the Lord's saying to me, Dan, that's good. They're taking care of your health, but Dan, you have to get on the line too. I want to talk to you today about getting back on the line. I'm not going to ask you to make a Herculean step. I'm going to ask you to re-engage. For some of you, you used to pray in college and don't pray like that anymore. Some of you used to lead prayer meetings and have kind of been there, done that. Some of you have had intentions. Today, I'm not going to emphasize the inward prayer of like the garden, the, the walk with God. That's an inward prayer. I'm talking about the outward prayer that changes things. The intercession prayer that's not about changing your heart, but it's about changing the affairs of nations and peoples and families and children and reports of health and reports of prosperity and reports of breakthrough. Though breakthrough doesn't happen with the inward prayer. Breakthrough happens with the outward prayer. Intercession is outward. Reflection is inward. Contemplation is inward. Some of you are disposed towards inward prayer. Good for you. Inward prayer blesses you, but it does not change the world. The world is changed by outward prayer. The disciples said to Jesus, how do we pray? He said, let me tell you how to pray. Our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come is in the imperative. You're not even asking, you're commanding. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Again, in the imperative. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day is not asking it's not the interrogative, it's the imperative verb, which means it is a command. You're saying to God, give me what I need today that your kingdom can come in the earth today and you lead me. Don't lead me in the ways of the devil, but deliver me from his ways. 
It's very outward. It's very militant. It's not the guy at the devotional reading and, and marking up his Bible and God speaking to him. You have to have that. This is a different kind of prayer. This is the kind of prayer of easy company. When a group of people, the whole church decides we're going to the line together. There's somebody over here that has a prayer need that cannot get a breakthrough without a person over here praying for them. There's somebody who needs a healing over there. And the key to your healing is somebody over there that will pray for your healing. The Bible says, pray for one another. Not just yourself. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Get back on the line. Can you hear an amen? You know, maybe I should quit right now. I got the people right up here, Melvin. There's only one way I can go, and that's down. It's time to wake up. Romans 13 says, The hour has come for you. The hour has come for you. The hour has come for you and for you and for you and for you. What does the hour come for us to do? It says here, to awake from your sleep. It's talking about a spiritual slumber, not a physical sleepiness. It's talking, guys, listen to me, guys. Our number one demon we face, fellas, is not lust. Now, that's a stinker. Nobody said amen. <laughs> Every man with a libido say amen. For you 12 guys that have libidos... We'll, we'll start a life group for you. Can we get Viagra in bulk? <laughs> married men. Married men. Now, what was I talking about? Oh, lust is not our biggest demon. It's passivity. It's couch potato Joe. It's that. Our biggest demon is passivity. Our wise biggest demon is not passivity. Matter of fact, we'd like them to get just a little bit of that. Can you chill, dear? <laughs> Sit down and chill for with me for a minute. The hour has come for you to wake up for the purpose of prayer. Now, when you're asleep and passive when it comes to prayer, you're not able just to wake yourself up. Like, I'm going to get going in prayer. I am, oh, I'm just going to get going tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, I am going to really get going. Nah. An object at rest stays at rest unless acted on by an outside force. So unless Sleeping Beauty gets the kiss from the prince, the Sleeping Beauty stays asleep. And unless there's an outside force on you. And how, what is that? For me, it was a dream. Hearing God say, Dan, get on the line, woke me up. It could be reading your Bible and a verse. It could happen in a worship service. It could happen here in a testimony. It could happen, listen to Caleb. It's God that's got to wake you up. But once he wakes you up, you're the one that's got to act on it. Here's a test for you. Pray this prayer with me. God, if you want me to go to early morning prayer, wake me up at 5. On Friday, wake me up at five. So lo and behold, without an alarm clock, you wake up at five. You know what you're going to do? You're going to lie there and say, Lord, if you want me to go to prayer, you're going to need to dress me too. I need the confirmation of two witnesses. If we're going to go all the way with this prayer thing, I... You got to obey. When God wakes you up, you got to take the step. And we say, Dan, I'm not a big intercession guy. Just take a step. Amen. Just take a step. Amen. And God will help you take the second step. So wake up, look up. 1 Peter 4 and 7, the end of all things is near. How many say that's true? The end of all things appears to be near. Thing in the Middle East with Israel and Iran and Russia, that thing could go off in 24 hours. It says here, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. So in the end times, it says, wake up 
and be alert, not for the purpose of evangelism or purpose of feeding the poor or the purpose of your family life, but for the purpose of prayer. And out of prayer will come the priorities of the rest of it. Man, if you think you're in the end times, the Apostle Peter is saying here, wake up and look up with what the Spirit of God is saying and pray. If the church does one thing well, it's not singing. And it's not building buildings. And it's not 25 missions trips. And I'm for all of those things. Oh, but nobody should be able to compete with us when it comes to prayer. When there's the call to prayer, we go to the line. We don't want to stay back two miles. We want to get in the foxhole. Says, I'm taking my position. I'm standing in the gap to pray the only kind of prayer. that I, You don't have to be a shouter. You don't have to be a Pastor Melvin who, who prays loud. You don't have to be like Pastor William who prays in the Amplified Bible. You don't have to be like my wife who never stops praying when she starts. You know, we, we prayed when we first married. You know, we kneel at the bed. And she'd pray and I would pray. So, you know, there's a lot of pressure on a guy to pray in front of their wife. There's a lot of pressure. You, know, you got to look halfway intelligent. And for a lot of us, that's, that's a miracle right there in of itself. So you get down there. We were first married. And I go something like, God, bless my wife. And we pray for wisdom and, uh, and stuff. Amen. She would actually elbow me. Like, that's not enough. Pray more. I'm still ticked off. You've got more words than me. You know, I say, bless the family. She'll go and bless her children, her future children, her grandchildren, her nieces and nephews, her aunts and uncles, spiritual children around the world. I pray for Aaron and Betty and Catherine and David and, uh, and Irvin and Frank and George, Harry, I, Irene, J, J, K, Karen, L, Linda, M, Mary, N, Nancy, O, Ophelia. And by the time she gets done praying, I'm either sleeping or I'm angry or I'm daydreaming about something. Step up. Colossians 4, 2 says, devote yourselves to prayer. Hey, man, devote yourselves to the gym. Be all about your body, but that can't be number one. Devote yourself to being financially secure for the future. Devote yourself to your job. Devote yourself to caring for your loved ones. Absolutely. But the scripture says, devote yourself. Be dedicated, committed to what? To prayer, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You might say, Dan, I don't know how to do that. One step at a time, sweet Jesus. You say, Dan, I don't know how to pray. Well, let me help you with that. First of all, it's an art, not a science. You do not get points for being eloquent. Don't say prayers. Let's start right there. Don't say prayers. Pray prayers. This is what gets me about a liturgical church, which I am a son of a liturgical church, where the pastors read prayers. Over time, they stop praying the prayers, and they start reading the prayers. And they're saying prayers. That's not praying. Saying prayers. Father, we thank you for this food, and the hands that prepared this food, bless this food to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. You just said a prayer. That didn't do any good. Jesus says, God does not hear you because of the multitude of your words or the vanity of your phrases. So you don't get any credit for that. It'd be better to say, God, bless this food in Jesus. Now, you don't have to be loud, but pray the prayer. Pray it. Don't say it. Pray. Don't think it. You want a prayer life? Stop thinking prayers. You don't pray as much in your thoughts as you think you do. I'm not praying out loud. I'm thinking my prayers. Oh, yeah, right. I know upstairs, lots going on up there besides prayer. Best thing to do is open your mouth. And pray out loud. Can you hear an amen to that? You can't say amen to another person's prayer unless they're praying outside, out loud in English. So how do you pray? Just start praying. Pray short prayers. Pray them frequently. Pray biblical prayers. And always give God thanks. And you'll develop a prayer life. 
Step up. Let's get back on the line of prayer. You see, we often have to deal with, number one, ungodly beliefs about prayer. Ungodly beliefs about prayer. You may have this ungodly belief. I'm not spiritual enough to pray. Well, welcome to the human race. Who is really spiritual enough to pray? It's better just to pray, do your best, and leave it in the hands of God. That's a lie of the devil. Or my prayer really doesn't change anything. Now, you never say that out loud. But the word of God says this. You have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you often don't get it because you're asking for selfish reasons. I get that. But the main premise, that's a particularization. The main premise is things will not happen in your life without prayer. So this phrase, let go and let God, is not a complete theological thought. If you let go and let God, there's a lot of stuff in your life you are going to miss. Others are going to miss a victory because you don't understand. We're partnering with God. Now, God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. He is sovereign. But he cannot decree everything that happens. If he did, then prayer would be a perfunctory exercise that had no effect on anything. We have to believe that prayer really changes things. Can I hear an amen to that? And so an ungodly belief is, well, God's going to do what God's going to do. His ways are deeper and higher than my ways. I should never expect an answer to prayer because there's some thing, there's some good reason, which I will never know, why he's not going to answer in the affirmative. That is a lie. That's just fouled up mess. It's just a fouled up mess. Why do you suppose the Bible says the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ? So you pray them. You with me? Promises in the word of God that are conditional are meant to be prayed. If you don't pray them, you're saying, Dan, are you saying that I'm not going to be all I can be in God if I don't pray? Exactly. You got it. And I'm going to go one step further. There's a person on the other side of the room that cannot be all they're meant to be unless you pray for them. We are an interconnected body of believers. Our destinies are in the prayer lives of other people. Pray for one another, the Bible says, that you may be healed. What's the implication? If you don't pray for one another, there is a consequence. You don't get healed. Let me say, this doesn't sound fair. You mean God is putting the responsibility of the affairs of the earth into my hands? Not entirely, but you're starting to get the picture of partnering with God. He takes it serious that you're his son and daughter. He takes it serious. The Bible says, Jesus said to his disciples, the sins that you forgive, I forgive, and the sins that you remit, I mean, you retain, I retain. So he's putting a great authority in the early apostolic church. He said, you've got the power to judge a sinful situation and to declare something forgiven, or you have the right to declare this is not yet forgiven. That's very powerful. God partnering with his church. God wants to partner with us with our prayer life. How about if you got to heaven and God gave you everything you prayed for? How many of you would say with me, man, I wish I would have prayed for more stuff. I wish I would have prayed for more victory. I wish I would have prayed for the church, the nation, the president, the families. The, the affairs of others, ungodly beliefs, or maybe you prayed and it didn't work. Now this is a this is tough. You you go way out on a limb with God. You pray a prayer based on a promise that you fulfill all the criteria. I mean, as best your ability, and it doesn't work. What do you do? You can pack it in. Come off the line, go back and permanently stay in a convalescent spiritual home and lick your wounds. Or you can say, I'm stepping back to the line and I'm going to pray again. And I'm going to pray again. Disappointment is the enemy of prayer. Particularly people that like to swing for the fence, which I do. I have been prayed for 19 years that my cancer markers would be zero. They've never been zero. Melvin even called me Pastor Zero. 
Remember that? Because we were believing God that my cancer markers would be zero for 19 years. Well, I've had lots of miracles in 19 years with my health, for sure, absolutely. But I've never had that one. So let's say I get my cancer markers checked and it's whatever the number is. And we were praying for zero. We're standing on God that it'd be zero. And it doesn't, it's not zero. What do, what do I do then? What do I do then? I step to the line and I say, even though he slay me, yet I will praise him. My love for God is not conditional on a single prayer. Jesus died for my sins and I'm working on this prayer life stuff. I don't get it all. But I do know one thing. If I don't have a savior, I'm dead in my sins and I'm bound for hell. That's enough to get answered. That one prayer, Jesus come into my heart, is one prayer I know was answered. And that one prayer is enough to live a life on. But you get self-centered, selfish people that don't theologically process nothing. So they go out on a limb and they don't get what they want. They just cave in on God. And I just go, good, good night. What kind of a believer are you? Unless everything pans out the way. Stuff happens. My dad died just out of the blue. Mom has got, she's a, mom's a diabetic, has a uh, heart problem. She has a uh, tick, 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 tick. Pacemaker. And a sh- 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 insulin and, you know, all that stuff. Dad's as healthy as a horse. Died in the middle of the night. And you go, well, that doesn't seem right. So what do you do? Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is not the same thing as acquiescing to everything that happens in this world as if it's from God. It's we contend and we fight, we contend and we fight, and if we lose a battle, we regroup and we fight on, we fight on. We never run up the white flag and say, well, I guess this prayer thing doesn't work. If anything, we're doubling down. I may have lost here, but devil, you picked on the wrong person. You just picked on the wrong person. You can take my health, take my family, take my job, take my reputation, but you can never take my prayer room. I'm a threat to you, not because I'm righteous or holy, but the righteous one's in me. And when the Spirit of God motivates me to prayer, I can speak to a mountain and it can be removed and cast into the sea. Whatever I say can be mine. Does that guarantee that everything I say will be mine? Of course not. We're not children. We're not children. Prayers for adults. I'm talking metaphorically here. It's for people that understand that it's a conflict. We win some, but we lose some. You see, we need to see prayer. Number two is our Christian duty. Whatever happened, duty to duty. Brother Mac, you were. You were in the Coast Guard for 25 years or whatever, 20 years, retired. You know something about duty. You don't say to somebody in the military, do you all want to report to the ship today? (laughs) Seriously, if you're not feeling it. You know, sometimes this Christian life, there are things, there's going to be a conflict here between your want to and your ought to. And when your ought to is not your want to, it's when you realize that the Christian life is a duty. It can't be you can only do what you feel led to do. That does not cut it. You can't just do the things that make you, that that's in my gift mix, that's in my sweet spot, that's in my vision, that's in my personal mission statement. Well, good for, how would you like that? Good for you. Sometimes there's duty. Jesus said in Luke chapter, is it Luke Jesus said, in Luke 18, verse 1, then he spoke a parable to them. This is the widow parable and the judge. That men ought to pray. Ought? Men ought to pray. You mean, God, you are putting on me a requirement? Exactly. You're a disciple of Jesus. The root of the word disciple is discipline. I'm sick of of all all altar calls being like this. Are you tired of leading your own life? Come to a Savior and find joy inexpressible and full of glory and a peace that passes all understanding. Come, 
taste the goodness of God. I love that altar call. How about this altar call? Come and take up your cross and follow him. And from this day forward, you deny yourself. Why isn't Christianity ever presented as a duty? How many people wake up on a Sunday and decide whether they want to go to church? I don't know if I want to today. It's a duty. Permitting is a duty. Tithing should be a duty. But we kind of just, you know, I'm not saying legalistically you've you got to go to church all the time. Or got to talk. You know what I'm not saying. I'm saying having the mentality, I signed up for something here. I signed up as a follower of Christ who gave me his word. I have a duty to fulfill his commands. And I got to get it in the, the duty column before you can get it in the delight column. Because if we just teach delight, do what delights you. Do what inspires you. Do what lifts you to a transcendent creative state. Well, good for you. Who's going to go to the, who's going to work in the nursery? I don't think a lot of people fee, are feeling it for the nursery. Feeling it. They'd rather be in the big meeting and listening to a dynamic speaker like me. But you know what I'm not saying? I'm not saying we make it legalistic. I'm talking about reframing. And the last thing, it's time to get on the line. It's our duty. The church is likened to a field, a building, a family, but also an army. It's time, submission means to come under, it's a military term. It's a time to find our place on the line, to stand in the gap with, that has our name assigned to it. It's time to see prayer, corporate prayer and personal prayer, not as a preference, but this is what Christians do. Not optional. You can't be in a foxhole without a gun. You can't be a Christian without a prayer life. You might say, well, Dan, I, you know, uh, I don't know about this. Well, all I can say to you is, Jesus said these words, you ought to do it. Really, there should be no commentary necessary if he said it. Remember, if we don't pray, we tie God's hands. They might say, that seems a little bit drastic, Dan. What I am not saying is that God's not sovereign. He is sovereign. I am not saying that God cannot do what God wants to do. Of course he can. And God can intervene in the affairs of man in any way, at any time, he that delights him. What I am saying is that the potential for new life is tied to our prayer. The future of our nation is tied to a praying church. The affairs in Israel today will go south if there's not a praying church. The church militant in the earth that says on this side of heaven, we implement the kingdom of God through our intercession. tie God's hands you see today prayer is bigger than just you and God I spoke at a church Pastor Melvin uh, last year had 1200 people on a Sunday they had a platform like this with a lot of the stuff looks great they had a great looking worship team, all young people, all attractive. The music was great. They didn't have one prayer meeting, Joanne. 1,200 people, not one prayer meeting. You know how many churches today don't have a church prayer meeting? Most. Most don't. Those that do are the Baptists and the Pentecostals. My dad's home church doesn't have a prayer meeting. This church has 25 prayer meetings. I say, Lord, do a prayer movement among us. May there be a contagious atmosphere of prayer in the house of the Lord. Can I hear an amen to that? Can we hear the Spirit of God calling us back to the line?
Hey, easy company. Jesus is saying, it's time to come back to the line. Dan, people have been carrying your water a long time. Those days you couldn't carry it. But those days are coming to an end. Do you remember the movie Top Gun? First movie. And, and uh, the, the dirty, rotten Russians were attacking. And Ice was out there fighting him in his jet by himself. And his wingman was supposed to be Maverick. Anybody remember that at the end? But Maverick's all froze up because he lost. He was in Goose, his wing, his... A navigator, he had killed him accidentally. Long story. So he's not engaging in the fight. And Ice, the other Navy pilots, just get chewed up by five enemy jets. So right towards the end of the movie. And the commanding officer on the aircraft carrier, excuse my language, but he said, for Christ's sake, Maverick engage. The Lord says to us today, for my sake, for my name's sake, somebody's in trouble. Will you please engage? You've got a $25 million plane you're sitting on top of. You have power and intercession that makes that plane look like it's a nothing burger. Will you engage? Will you engage? Will you get back in the fight? Lord, I pray this church will hear your clarion call to get back on the line. Of course, Lord, we want it to be a duty, but in, excuse me, a delight. But in the meantime, we say, yes, sir. I'll find my foxhole again. I'll stand in the line. I'll pray for others for your kingdom to come. In Jesus' name, amen.